It is October the 30th, 2021, and you're listening to The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Hello and welcome back to a proper episode of The Future of Photography. We're not on beaches or in vineyards and... No? What? Sorry. I thought we were getting loads of extra music coming in. It turned out it was a browser window uh, of mine, which had started automatically playing something. I apologize. I thought I thought we were having a technical difficulty. It's Sorry. okay. No, no. Let this it is, roll. Let it roll. This is in the episode. Music? Have we got new music? This is okay. It's for whoever, whoever, whoever is not watching the video, Adrian was just like holding up his hand and it's like, something's wrong here. So, <laughs> Sorry. It's not good. It's okay. Um, 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 proper episode. We are back in the studio um, or in our respective Somewhat. corners of the world uh, improvised studios, um, wherever they may be. Prisons, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Prison slash studio. You might call them that. Slash like, office. No, no, this is my office, my studio. I, li I like the word studio. It sounds so much more serious. I have, yeah, a, I have a second room upstairs, which... Ah, we use for all sorts of things, but when we do a photo workshop here, it turns into a photo thing, and there's like my reflectors and my backgrounds and stuff somewhere in a, in a cabinet in there. So th this one here is my Studio A, and upstairs is Studio B. Doesn't that sound beautiful? It does sound good. So you're in your YouTube studio at the moment. And I'm in Studio A right studio. now. Yes. <laughs> your phot photographic studio is upstairs. Nice. <laughs> and, you know, I'm on location in a uh, rented home that has basically every corner could not be harder and more reflective of sound yes we can so hear that but booming. it's fine, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> anyway um yeah uh, imar is uh, busy she has work to do so uh, we have to do without her today unfortunately um okay so here, here's a topic that i thought might be interesting for today and it is about the big cameras, the proper cameras, the real cameras, the flagship cameras. And the reason I thought of this was because the Nikon, Nikon, ZZ9, how do we call this, by the way? Do we use the, I think over here on In this English, side of the ocean, Nikon. we call it uh, Nikon uh, Z9, uh, Z9, yeah, no, Z, Z9. <laughs> So, what would we, so in, in England, it would be the Nikon Z9. What is, what is it in Germany? Well, in German pronunciation, is Nikon Z9. Okay. So we'll, we'll oh, yeah. stick with the and, Nikon uh, Z9. It, it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, in it, America, it would be Nikon, except for the Nikonos. True. <laughs> yes. So, so you don't have Nikkor lenses, though, do you? Because that's got a double case. Nikkor so lenses, still be yes. Nikkor lenses. They're Nikkor. Sorry, Nikkor it, does it matter? No, it doesn't. Um... <laughs> So here's here's the thing. Here's the thing. This camera uh, is making a bit of a splash right now. So I was wondering where's where's this going? We have we we used to have the DSLRs with the big flagships, the whatever you want to call them. Um, the the let's call them the Halo products, the big ones, the Formula One cars of the camera industry, and. Um, that will then, the technology will trickle down into other cameras, which is kind of the way th these things go. And um, now in the pro segment, the flagships, the Canon might be the Canon, might be the R3, Sony the A1. Uh, and uh, Nikon had been a bit, well, they had the, Z, the Z6 and 7, but they weren't quite on that level of, in air quotes, pro camera. But now, the Z9 is out, or it is about to be out. We, we've seen prototypes online. We've seen the, the YouTubers, the usual sus suspects, uh, have have them, and they play with them, and they show them off. So that whole promotional uh, thing is in progress. And um, <clears throat> it's, I don't know, there's... The, 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 the smartphones have taken over quite a lot of stuff Right, they have taken over from a certain segment of the camera, somewhere in the middle, I guess, um, or at least have have really taken uh, business out of that segment. Um, Here's a question: Sure, go what ahead. What does what does a professional camera, a flagship camera, offer that some of the quote lesser expensive 
lighter, more plasticky, call it what you will, cameras offer. What do you think is the difference? Um, so I, I guess we have to make a definition here. What does the yeah. pro side really mean? And I think the cameras that we're talking about here are probably supposed to be more in the sports segment. Yeah. And Indeed. tank like, right? Tank -like, so they're yes. they're big and they're strong and and they're fast and they are heavy and they are incredibly <laughs> fast. Did I mention fast? Because this one seems to be able to shoot at 120 frames per second, which is that's not photography, that's slow motion video. So <laughs> it's just like it just it, it, yeah, I think and and Chris, yeah, what you said there about sports, definitely. I mean, these things often launch around Olympic years, don't they, and stuff like that. So. I, uh, and and sports and wildlife seem to be the the hardest things to to make photographs of because you've got to have fast autofocus and uh, you've got to have yeah you got it's, it's got to track things and it's got to be be quick and speedy and so so I think that's that's what we're talking about in the flagships I think isn't it I think it's a, there's a de separation for me these days between a a pro quality studio camera which maybe doesn't suffer such a hard life and maybe can be a bit smaller and a bit more lightweight uh, versus a pro quality outdoorsy camera, which, which uh, maybe journalists would have as well, perhaps. I don't know. I think pro, pro I, I've, I've certainly taken professional photos with cameras that were way below what we're talking about here. I mean... It, from from today's point of view, entry level type of cameras, but um, professional work, in my definition, is work that you get paid for. Right, That's a good point because I've very much taken exactly. a lot of unprofessional photographs with really expensive cameras as well. So yeah, don't forget. <laughs> very true. I mean, I, I do think I, I do think that we've hit on something that the pro moniker is probably more of a marketing term than it really is a useful kind of. Um, overall definition of the quality and speed and associated um, kind of capture yeah. mechanisms. I think I think it de definitely. I mean, it's there. There is a certain class of product, isn't there? Which if they they put pro in the name for the marketing to get you to take it seriously, but really that they only do that when they're marketing to amateurs yeah. <laughs> and people who are less well educated. <laughs> I think this one though, I mean, th this Nikon though, it feels pretty much the real deal actually for uh you know for, from what i've heard and read and watched uh, uh about it i mean it's um uh it, i mean it's yeah it's got everything it's even got like a proper wired ethernet if right? you, it's a port and stuff like that for when you're at the side of a, a an athletics pitch or a football pitch or whatever it might be that you can get your images out to press down an actual real ethernet cable <laughs> I mean, this is this That's, is it's, it looks like there are certain standards kind of emerging in that field, and we're if you compare those flagships, they have a few things in common. We're talking about latest, the latest types of sensors, so-called stacked CMOS sensors, which is a sensor that is not just capturing light on the one side, but it's also it has memory under each of the little pixels, so it can read out the sensor almost instantly and that eliminates a few things like rolling shutter and these kind of things so, <laughs> so it's, a bit, you know, it's a bit more than that though on this camera they've eliminated the shutter which they've, again yes there is there is no shutter or no no there is no shutter in this camera so you pay your five and a half thousand dollars and you don't even get a shutter in your camera what's <laughs> and, that all about <laughs> and we'll get back to that in a second because that is actually one of my pet peeves with this camera but anyway so they have the stacked cmos uh, sensor in there and in the Canon R3 and in the Sony A1, they have this um, this super fast shutter readout kind of thing, which which gives you some advantages. They shoot they shoot raw at twenty to thirty frames per second, which yeah, I don't think you need more for full full size raw photos. They have uh, in body image stabilization, which used to be the realm of the smaller, cheaper cameras, kind of the more amateurish cameras, because amateurs apparently weren't weren't able to hold the camera still enough so but then now now the, the they doing this in the big cameras as well they have 4k video at 100 frames per second which for who, uh, jeremiah doesn't? might who be interesting doesn't? right who, who does i think, I think they shoot now. at 8k it doesn't do 8k at 60 frames a second uh, as well. 8k at 
30 or 60, somewhere 30, in that okay, range. Yeah, yeah. They do 10 bit, uh, or 10 bit uh, dynamic range, which is the norm now so, in that thing. They have so can, I, can we just do a little bit of mental arithmetic on the 8K thing? Because I can never remember this. At 8K, so that's 8,000 vertical lines, isn't it? Which means it's probably, if it's a 3 by 2 camera, it's going to have about 5,000 horizontal lines. So were we talking about 40 megapixel of video. video just just for those yeah. who think more in terms of, of photography still photography and megapixels 40 yeah. megapixels of video mm -hmm. um, bear in mind i don't even have a 4k display in my house i think yeah <laughs> um, that, but that's 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 a lot of that's a lot of capacity to shoot there isn't it you're gonna you're gonna capture a lot of information with that so uh jeremiah when when you you are on location right now when you shoot there do you produce and shoot everything in 8k at this no, or 4K um, and, mostly. And, uh, yeah, we shoot in 4K. Uh, if we're going super high speed, like uh, we're using a Panasonic Vericam, right? Which which will just noiseless at close to 5,000 ISO. It's it's dazzling. Uh, at 3,200, you couldn't even see any noise, uh, and uh, you can shoot 240 frames at uh, 2K. And, and it, for television, it's it's more than adequate. 4K is the standard. Um, 6K is ideal because it gives you a little more latitude in, in kind of reframing or adjusting and special effects, etc. But the management of uh, filming in 6K is significant. Um, the and then when you go to 8K, even more significant. So that what's required is extra uh, digital technicians, extra storage, offloading uh, a lot more. On it the adds up, doesn't side. it? It, 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 it adds it up because a, you you don't just have the the 4K or 6K footage you shoot. You have to have a couple of backups of no, that. That's and, the cheapest. The and, cheapest thing is right. To shoot. You have to have backups of it. The processing requires beefier computers. It, all that stuff is a. It, it it really does add up, and and uh, I I know this because of course my thinking initially when I arrived was like, yeah, I want to shoot everything in 6K, even 8K. That's great. And of course, when you start to <laughs> add the knock-on effect of that. And, and relative to the expense and what else you can spend it eats your into budget the budget, on. doesn't it? Well, it, I mean, it it's, does, it's, it's really true to say sense. that, you know, because the maths would suggest that, that 8K gives you four times as much information as 4K, which in turn gives you four times as much information as 2K exactly or, or your like traditional that, HD, close. you know, 1080p yeah. kind of yeah. thing, which is broadly speaking 2K, isn't it? So, 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 if you had a, if if you were going to watch this on a on a 1080p television, like one of the ones that I have in my house, because I haven't bought a TV in a few years, um, then the 8K would be is that 16 times as many pixels as I can actually see on my screen. Sort of, that's, yes. Yeah, that's kind of that's a lot. If, so, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, cool. I mean, most cool. people, most people. Um, who are into television uh, do have now 4K. I think it's it's kind of a standard. Like when you go, you wouldn't go into a consumer electronics store and say, "I really want a 1080p camera, a, a, a monitor." This is I really don't care really as long want. as it's a plasma screen, to be honest. And and the rest of the <laughs> and the rest of the people, the majority are watching on devices this size. We're talking yeah, a, a smartphone, which are 4K. Which yeah, but 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 small. So the 4K doesn't really yeah. uh, work. Where, that where it adds up is if you were going to do a big special effects film to be projected on a big screen uh, with a lot of effects and dupes and things, then it really does make sense. Also, yeah. 6K is really good if you need in advance that you're going to be using the center of the frame. In other words, reduce a few fields so that you can adjust for camera shake, wow, um, yeah. mm -hmm. and reframing. So, uh, so that becomes a professional see I can see 6K as being a really useful resolution to shoot at for precisely that reason, if you are, say, yeah, especially for you know, theatre releases, which would be projecting in 4K, I guess, won't they? Yeah. Let me yeah. let me try to take us back to the to the Z9, the Nikon, yeah, the <laughs> Nikon Z9, um, because I don't, I, I guess, and uh, Jeremiah, correct me if I'm wrong. 
Um, you would probably not use a camera of that type that is more geared towards still photographers on a, on a Hollywood movie well, set, right? You know, it's interesting. I just spoke to a, a cameraman, a really, really well-known, very um, technically uh, adept DP, not, not a DP that I'm using, by the way, but, but someone who had just touched base with me. And he had just finished shooting an indie film with the Black Magic. Mm, okay. Uh, okay. And which is, just, you know, looks for it's all It's tiny compared purposes. to the cameras you work with. Exactly. And uh, I think they shot it in six or eight K. I forget what he said, but he said the results were absolutely dazzling, uh -huh. beyond dazzling. And, and that camera is five grand or six grand, something yeah, like yeah. that. Right. Um, mm. And uh, he shot the whole film like that. Right. So, so, so back back to the list of uh, kind of the, the 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 features that these flagships have in common. Um, there's three more on the list. One is dual slots. That for some reason seems to be the defining factor of a pro camera versus not so pro camera. That you have two card slots, which. It's yeah. a big argument about that on the internet a couple of years ago. Wasn't yeah. There? I'm not going you know, down the thing that about rabbit hole. No, I'll, I'll go down for a moment. I'll dip my toe in that rabbit hole. Uh, you know, the, one of the problems that those dual card, like obviously if you're in the field and you're a combat photographer and you're getting a massive amount of high quality images, you don't want to be like shuffling. You don't want to be downloading, well, uploading. You but that, you is, want but that is using two slots in, in series, yeah, but then you can also use right, them in parallel for a backup. Uh, yeah, I was getting there. So the backup can be very useful if you are working in kind of nasty conditions and, and you have issues of dust and water and... and or the bride's mother see. if you lose the photographs. Oh, that's oh, yeah. two weddings, yeah. <laughs> so uh, if I've used a camera like that, it's generally to back it up to make sure that I have ongoing backup. And, and uh, I think that that does become useful. Um, I think that there's more stabilization now in cards, though, that they, they are capable of much more robust right. um, you know, action and resistance to those kinds of things. All right. So, so dual slots might have their justification for some cases, or they do probably have that. Um, Wi-Fi on board is, by, by the way, except for the Canon <laughs> R3, which doesn't have that, you have to buy an extra module. But uh, interestingly enough, that's a feature that has not been on the flagships uh, in a, quite a while. It's a, that's been trickling up from the amateur level cameras. But then, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Adrian, Ethernet on board, a gigabit Ethernet. So these cameras have an Ethernet port that you hook up to a cable and then run to somewhere directly to a picture desk somewhere in the in the back of the stadium that you're shooting in and uh or or out and beyond even uh a, a friend of mine worked when was the sochi olympics the winter olympics in sochi about 10 years it was in the ago. winter yeah sorry it was in the winter or something. it was in the winter yeah thanks for that yeah uh, it's just, uh he he worked there i think he was working with one of the big american networks um uh, and they had a huge site you know there in the olympics they had a huge capability a big team lots of technical yeah. stuff going on um i think uh, that doesn't happen so much anymore Poss possibly for tv but for stills i think it's you know your your, your picture desk can be back at base you know you could be well, in the, you could be for, at yeah. the tokyo olympics and the picture desk could be in new york sure same thing for fashion i mean i can imagine um you know um that uh, in a fashion spread it used to be the editor would come to the studio and you know post covid i think that happens less and less so you know, a fashion photographer can just basically Ethernet the session right to the the desk of the editor uh, in New York somewhere, uh, and selects and adjustments can be done there right away. Um, so um, I, I think it has its place in commercial or professional usage. I've, um, I could do with a new webcam as well. Maybe I'll get one of these as a new webcam. <laughs> I'm looking straight into the barrel of a canon 5d mark IV still here on as my webcam so <laughs> that's no, a bit you know, of a, i've got my yeah that's decadent my webcam is what is what it's what fuji called a couple of years ago their flagship at least in the uh unless you go to the medium format so you know 
I so hear. anyway, this camera coming out is it, there, there's certainly a justification for having this kind of a camera. Of course, first, as I said, as a Halo product, so it will maybe pioneer things that will then go into the lower grade cameras. Um, for for picture taking, the image quality, I don't see too much difference, especially for amateurs um, between these and and the lower. Uh, price models, the not as rugged models, but I guess that if you if you do pixel peeping, if you look at every single pixel individually, you might see some difference. But yeah, um, the one thing How that would, I, sorry, go ahead, Jeremiah. I was just going to ask a question: Is uh, has anyone done a, a, a comparison of say the Fuji or the Hasselblad so-called medium format cameras with some of these? flagship uh, Neo 35 millimeter cameras. I mean, I think I think there's quite the. I remember uh, a, a while ago when when Fuji started putting out the, some of their you know, their medium format sensors. What they're about 44 by 55 mil, aren't they, or something like that? Um, there were people saying, "Well, would you pay?" Yeah, because originally the the thing was they were about eight or nine thousand, weren't they? And uh, I know they've come down in price then. But that people were saying, well, "Would you would you pay for that bigger sensor when actually in a top flight DSLR of the day, you were getting similar pixel counts, perhaps, and and maybe it was the the quality was was just as good. You could argue. Um, I think I, I I haven't seen anybody do that with this latest crop of cameras. Um, uh, and maybe the argument these days is more about personal taste or or, or or use case. So if you are maybe if you are shooting the Olympics, uh, maybe you want the you you want that big flagship. And I was going to say DSLR. They're not that anymore, are they? <laughs> they don't have mirrors anymore. But the but the big flagship sports camera. Maybe if you're looking for something that is more about image quality rather than image velocity. <laughs> So you'd be looking for something medium format. I don't know. Prices are very similar now, aren't they? You can buy well, a Fuji are, medium format the... camera, camera for less than some of the. I mean, know, the, I think the, the Z9 is five thousand five hundred dollars. That's yeah. I'm uh, pretty sure you can get a brand new Fuji medium format camera for that money. You know, nowadays. Yeah, the Hasselblad uh, H2, I think. What so it is. image quality in medium format, even though digital medium format isn't real medium format, the sensors are not as big as proper film medium format. But um, they are bigger than the full-frame sensors, and that, in, as a result, will change the way depth of field works and all these kind of things, which is, I think, way more important than details about uh, technical details about how the pixels work. Well, that's true, uh, Chris, but do you think that we are entering a, uh, an era where AI is going to basically make all of these mechanical or you know, digital choices um, moot? Because one could basically, I mean, if the iPhone processor was capable of uh, analyzing each pixel and the kind of overall uh, image, what it meant, and you actually said, I want this not to be impressionistic, but I want this to be more like a, you know, uh, medium format, large format, and there would be an interpolation. Um, I can see that happening. Right. So it's, it's, can, we, can we talk about that in a not black and white way? Because I think for me, part of the answer to your question there, Jeremiah, is that you know, it's, it's about the percentage coverage of, of use cases. So, you know, maybe, you know, I so think you you know, uh, for, for many, that, please? For, for many use cases, uh, I think that that now current digital cameras are, are are right up there, and you don't necessarily need these big flagship things. So you could buy a thousand dollar camera, and I think that would that would cover eighty percent of the use cases, maybe closer to ninety percent of the use cases. You know, you could do professional fashion photo shoots with something like that. You could shoot. I don't know, a slightly slower sport, maybe like, I don't know, bowls or something like that. Curling, but, you know, curling. Cur curl, yes, definitely. That's a very good example of a slow pole sport. Excellent choice. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and, 
yeah, so I think you you could do that with the vast majority of cameras there. So so the I, I mean, you mentioned AI as well. Oh, I, I'm I'm not sure I I could quite fold AI into my immediate answer to your well, question. But the Z9 brings AI in the box, and uh, especially around the autofocus because it does uh, vehicle autofocus, animal autofocus, people autofocus. So it it really does a whole bunch of different. Uh, things in that respect, I'm not sure it does any image manipulation AI in terms of, I don't know, replacing things, sharpening things, changing the colors and stuff. I think that is still down to the photographer. There's two things um, uh, that the, this comparison between different price levels of cameras. There's one video by Kai Wong, um, who is a YouTuber who used to be with Digital Ref TV. Um, where he did an episode a while ago, years, a couple of years ago, I think, about um, he, he compared shooting with expensive cameras and cheap glass versus shooting with a cheap camera and expensive glass, ah. as in lenses. So he and in that video, I've, I'm going to put a link in the show notes. This is uh, th this is one of those. Hmm, OK, maybe the camera is not that important things. Mm -hmm. um, and the other is he he had. He was one of my sources looking at his latest video where he shoots with the Z9, um, where it was invented to a press event and got his hands on a on a prototype, on an early uh, camera. It's um, not in stores yet, I guess. And uh, he showed one thing, and that really irked me about this camera. But yes, it doesn't have a shutter, but yes, you also <laughs> can't hear a shutter. So... <laughs> he he goes he goes and, and holds down the button and goes this is shooting 20 frames per second right now but you do not get an indication of that there are actually photos being taken and that it's it's like your tesla <laughs> yeah oh that's a good no, no that that one Ooh. actually that one actually makes noise because it has to make noise legally <laughs> at least at exactly. slower speeds so so but but this is a different thing with a camera because um so can you not switch i i had thought i'd seen on some somewhere other about the z9 that you can switch on an artificial shutter sound that would I then would expect go. that to be the case but in that video it wasn't and that really rubbed me the wrong uh, way because I have it's this I, I still have this okay you press the button we're talking still photography right you press the button and you and the camera makes a statement clack it tells you yeah. now the photo <laughs> is in the box and I uh, need that and 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 of course we're now entering especially with 8k video we're entering a time where maybe still photography will lose some of its importance because you will have video and you just grab a frame from that and it'll be just fine but yeah. this this definite like moment the decisive moment that moment seems to be evaporating in some respect. Uh, or, or the decisive moment will be found in post. Yes. <laughs> yes. Which takes uh, a bit uh, of actual, satisfaction actual out of the photography for me. I yes. agree with that. I, like, I, for me, that feedback is important. And by the way, there's a lot of discussions on electric motorcycles of putting artificial sounds in because... But there's, there, there, so there's I've had this conversation with my next door neighbor though. I've had this conversation with my next door neighbor who has a BMW and it's got a fairly sporty engine and a pretty sporty exhaust. Um, I mean, I live next door to him. Whenever he turns <laughs> it on, it, I can hear it. I'm sport I suspect we could hear it at the end of the street, to be honest. Oh, it's a lovely sound. Don't get me wrong. It's a it's a V8 with a with a sports exhaust on it. it makes a great sound. The conversation I have with him because we're all electric in our household now. We don't have any <laughs> internal combustion cars anymore. And he was saying to me, "Well, what are you what what, what you know, you used to have a car that sounded really nice. You know, Where's the like, joy in what, that? <laughs> where's yeah. and and I and I used to say to him, well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's something. I mean, years ago, there was something really, yeah, you know, really visceral about you get in the car and you turn the key and the engine fires up just behind your shoulder and it goes vroom, right? And and that is something that it you know definitely adds something to the experience. But personally, these days, I, I I'm happy to trade that away for not burning up all the there but the yeah the, the the it is a it is a thing um uh, and you know i can see you know if, if i take a photo and it doesn't make a sound um 
I, I, I don't know. It's like it. I, I, th- I think there's definitely use cases for it though, because even way back yeah, since 2015, I think I got. I think when I got my Fuji XT1, that had a silent shutter mode, and that was still nice to have. Or maybe it was the X100. I forget which one it was. Um, and I think it definitely has its place. But also having a big proper thwunk, you know, thwunk or whatever the sound is that a, a shutter actually makes. It's different. The, the cameras have personalities. Ones. That's that's one yeah, of the important things. The and Bronica not, was great for that. The and I, and I don't I don't bring that up for nostalgia reasons. That's important. <laughs> the very important distinction with cars. I think a lot of that is nostalgia. This is the way it used to sound. Room room. Um, with a camera, the the shutter sound has a function. It does have mm-hmm. a very so is important. It, so function. this is a, here's a question for you both. Then, it's like right? the period because at when we the talk end about of the sentence, you know. It's when, like, yep. So, but when we talk about, let's talk about medium format cameras, right? Let's talk about a class of medium format camera. Pick one. We've all probably owned them, where there's a blooming great big mirror in it, um, and actually mm-hmm. uh, the the shutter is actually a leaf shutter built into the lens and is, to all intents and purposes, pretty much silent. So. What what do you feel about that then? Yeah, because if you took the shutter out of that camera, it would still make the noise because the mirror it's the mirror slap that makes the noise. So what, nah, but yeah. but but the leaf shutter makes a noise, a very very subtle noise, but oh, there yeah, is a noise. Pretty, so it's a tick yeah. sound, and some you know you know I I would go as far, and this is probably its own episode that we're entering right now. I would go as far <laughs> as saying different cameras have different personalities, and different people in front of your camera react better to certain types of shutter sounds and cameras you know some people need need that big medium format camera straight in their face and some people need the the subtlety of a, of a leica well uh, and i understand you know. actually if you're doing something like fashion photography where you know that the model need some level of understanding of when the photo has been taken so that they are able to change their pose um uh so that that's yeah that, that, there is a need there there is actually a need to get the job done there is a need for some kind of audible feedback um but uh now i think i think i have seen a video chris for the z9 where you can actually switch on a range of shutter sounds or, or okay. a range of volumes of shutter sound or something like that anyway i'm, I'm a bit remember, relieved what, what was a... the what was that uh website that cataloged uh camera shutters yeah, oh, and the we, sounds. I think we had this earlier. Yes, we did. Yeah. We talked about it. We, yeah, we have somewhere talked about in it. Our, I can't remember yeah. what it was called, but yeah, we have talked about that before. Yeah, what will we do now? And but so, uh, but it's it's not just the lack of the shutter sound that that, that really gets me. So so in terms of technology, this is a camera now that has no physical or no mechanical shutter. Um, now, it does. It what does. does that it has. For- it has a shutter, and the shutter is now oh, yeah, in front of the. It, it, the shutter is now there to protect the sensor when you take the lens yes. off. That's all but that's it does. More like yes. a garage door. That is more yes, like a garage is. door than it is an actual <laughs> shutter, though, isn't it? But yeah, it's. It, it, so, what does this say about you know, the state of technology? I mean, we've heard for years about global shutters are on the way, and 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 you know, and that. Um, yeah, and that rolling shutter is a, is is something that almost every video camera review for the last fifteen years has had to discuss in some way, shape, or form. Um, at least before you get to you know super professional levels. Um, but they clearly here now a Nikon believe that they've got so good at this stuff that they don't even need a mechanical shutter. Which I think I read somewhere that the the read time, in the read time from the sensor was something like four milliseconds. But if you flip that over and think about well, what equivalent shutter speed is that, it was somewhere, I think, uh, uh, I think this might have been on DP Review, I, I, I saw this. It's, they said something, they think the shutter is, re- or the sensor is reading out in about a 270th of a second. Yeah. So, you know, so actually you could get a, a decent flash sync speed at a 200th of a second uh, and still get the whole of the flash you know, in, inside the, the shutter readout time, uh, the sensor readout time. Um, and, uh, you know, actually a 270th of a second should be enough to stop a lot of different types of motion. I still couldn't Is quite figure out, though, if you're shooting Formula One and taking pan shots and you've, and, and you've only maxing out a 270th of a second, there must be some rolling shutter effect in, a, in that kind of thing. But and, I don't know. Uh, and to be clear, the, the reading out of the shutter is not the minimum shutter speed, but it is what determines the rolling shutter. 
So yes, sorry, I should have been more clear on that. Of course, you, you can yeah, shoot th- at a, a, eight th- a thousandth of a second if you want to. Or well, 32 thousandth or something. <laughs> Whatever they is do. There, yeah, yeah, is yeah, there nice. any mechanicals in that camera at all? Any moving parts? Um, the Ooh. sensor is moving for stabilization, yes. Yeah, so, good point. I was going to say the autofocus, but that would be in the lens, wouldn't it, rather than the... Uh, it does have moving parts. But um, anyway, uh, what does that mean for the future of photography? What does the Nikon Nikon Z9, Nikon Z9... Um, I feel for Jeremiah on this. He hasn't said because, Jeremiah, you're both Canadian and American. So which do you which do you even choose? Still, or do you get to use both? It's always been Nikon. Always been Nikon. No, but the Z or the Z, though. Are you the, are you the Z or the Z, though? Because Canadian, ca- Canadian oh, that's true. That's is usually yeah. Z, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's been a problem for me. <laughs> we feel your pain. We do. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I don't think we will have a conclusive answer to that question in this episode. But um, well, I t- it's I- really, I, I think the real, it, the next generation of cameras will not only have, say, less mechanics, um, but I, I do think the integration of AI in the system of the photography that is coupled with whatever lens you're using. In other words, it will know the lens, it will know the glass, it'll know the the, uh, patterns of light through the glass, be able to compensate for that, understand the picture, adjust the pixel density and, and tonalities, color or black and white, and create a picture that you can kind of preset. That's that that would be something that I could imagine that you get a camera where you can really end up with any kind of 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 look uh, that is adjustable in system. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing where that goes as well. So one of the things that I was tracking before they changed ownership was where Olympus had decided to go with this stuff because they had in their in their micro four thirds cameras they'd started to build in some computational stuff, and I always thought it was a real shame that 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 kind of got cut short before they could properly explore it because they they you know, they went out <laughs> went out of business and had to sell the company and all of that sort of stuff and so i, I don't know whether um uh, uh, whether the om digital the, the new owners uh, are going to to continue to develop in that arena but if one of the other major mainstream brands uh, starts heading in that direction more it'd be really interesting to see where that ends up Definitely. And it could come out of left field. It, it, it may not be uh, coming out of a traditional camera company at all. Yes. Um, you know, it, it could come out of NVIDIA or something like that. Or, um, or well, probably from China. But we'll, we'll get to that <laughs> in DJI. our picks of the week. Yeah. I think this is a good spot to, to transition yeah. over to our picks of the week. And I've brought one that is from... The 1980s, and uh, oh, this is cool. an article in Petapixel, and uh, it is about how you used to transfer photos. We were talking about these flagships with Ethernet ports and instant uh, transfer to the picture desk in New York, that kind of stuff. Um, this is what they used to um, use in the field to <laughs> transfer photos. We're talking about a, a drum scanner. So you'd have a photo... As a, as a developed photo, so you'd have, you'd have film, you develop this, you enlarge it, and then you have it on paper, and then you put it in a drum scanner, and that one um, rotates and does three passes, one for each color, so we're talking color, and it oh, transfers okay. a photo to another location through a phone line going... So- like, so, uh, so is that what you'd call a fine art fax machine? <laughs> it, that's pretty much what it is. And for like a thirty uh, for 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 a color photo, that thing would take about thirty minutes. So, and and what, is, what are you talking there? Are you talking about a, a six by four, you know, a f- photo, sort of. maybe an eight by ten photo if you're lucky. Sort of. And we're, we're talking we're talking about the 1980s. So this is like 50 years ago. It's not that far. What was the printing? So, so at the receiving end, does it say what was the printing technology? Was it dot matrix? <laughs> I don't even know what it used. God, it couldn't have been. Nobody would have bothered with that. But wow! So, cool. so we we really have come a long way in a relatively short time, I would say. Um, yeah, definitely. 
All right, uh, Adrian, what is your pick? Uh, mine, is, mine is an antidote to a conversation about technology. Um, I, this, I, this I came across. Uh, it's a YouTube video, um, and it is a recent short interview with Elliot Erwitt. Um, some of our listeners and viewers m may recognize the name if they don't if they don't recognize his work um he's very known for humorous photographs especially of dogs on the streets of new york um but he has of course done a whole lot of other stuff as well no, I, I, um, I was just saying don't reduce him to dog photos oh no no please. not in the slightest no 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 it was only by way of introduction no per, per, perish the thought i i am very sorry no but it was it was just by way of introduction if people thought they yeah. might have recognized the name um but the uh yeah so so uh the youtube channel i can never remember what it's called it's called like three blind men and an elephant or something like that and, three and, blind men it, and an elephant productions yes yes okay um and uh yeah, which is a channel of uh, a new york based photographer um uh, and he's he's just published uh this uh brief heavily edited video with Elliot Erwitt, who seems to be a man of very few words in his later years, but all of them are absolutely hilarious and it's well worth a watch. <laughs> Amazing. Certainly a master of street photographer. Yes. yes. So uh, and and of the deadpan one liner as well. <laughs> <laughs> all right. In link in the show notes. And last but not least, Jeremiah. I thought since we're talking about big heavy cameras. <laughs> You brought us a small uh, I one. Thought, uh, I, I, I brought you something that I'd shot my vlog on. and uh, Oh, did you? Oh, right. Yeah, shoots 4K. I've been using it on my location surveying and demonstrating certain kinds of shots. It's a, it's a really, I've had it for a while. I have the first version of it. And, so it's, and, it's the DJ uh, Pocket. It's a DJI Pocket. It is a, a pretty amazing thing, and they don't lie about the Pocket. <laughs> you can really you can throw stick, it in you your can pocket. Really stick it in your pocket. Ah, Not cool. like that. You could track yourself or anyone just by touching the screen, and uh, it will track it, stabilize it, um, move it. Uh, you can move the camera every which way, and it will stabilize. It shoots panoramics. It shoots uh, stills as well as video, and um, the 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 quality is. It's kind of shocking. Oh, we, we've I mean, seen it. Every everyone who's listening to this, the last episode where we did the vlogs. If you only listen to this, go watch it because then you can see the output from that camera in action. Um, yeah. it, the, the DJI in general is the pace of innovation. These this company does is is mind blowing. So I think we'll have to do like a DJI episode sooner or later because they are yeah. they are releasing a, a, a bunch of interesting things. Just right now, so yeah, hmm. mm, that'd be a good idea. Actually, we should do that. Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah, we could just do a, an episode on innovation and where it's coming from. Yes, that too. Yeah. All right, and with that, I think we are uh, at the end of this episode. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Um, just quickly, so while the music rolls, is anybody going to buy a Z9? <laughs> uh, Not me. <laughs> Let me think. Sad, sad, sadly, it's a bit out of my justification range. Well, and I'm bought into the Canon system. Um, <gasps> I'll, I'll be it's still the EF lenses, so that's out on the way Emer. out anyway. Maybe, maybe Emer, right? Maybe Emer again. <laughs> we'll ask her next week when we see her again. Possibly. Yeah, there's wild things happening in, in the world of cameras. And uh, we will be back next week with more. Until then, everyone, um, thanks for watching. Go check us out online at thefuturephotography.com Until then, bye. Bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com